Hello, everybody. Hi, all, all our friends out on YouTube. This is a, this is a true panel. Uh, a lot of you are used to seeing our community gatherings every Friday at 4.30. Uh, this is a little different. This is a monthly panel. This is a program that we used to do before COVID. Um, the community gathering was a response to COVID, a re response to, sh to the shutdown. Uh, and it really focuses on the community and giving people an opportunity to say who they are and what they do, and uh, as well as hear from interesting people who have interesting things to say about the arts and making theater happen during a shutdown. Um, tonight we're doing what is known as our monthly panel. Um, we've been doing these since we started. This is actually how we started. Uh, 27 years ago we started doing panels. Um, I have guests coming who are going to talk to you a little bit about who they are and what they've been doing and specifically these are people that run festivals. Um, festivals are one of the great steps and great uh, opportunities for developing new work. Um, many of you out there may know, know of your favorite festivals already and have been in festivals and many of you are thinking about it and wondering uh, whether the festival route is the way to go. Um, I generally say yes it is, but that's me. Um, so it's, it's a great way to get your work up in front of an audience learn a lot about your work, learn what works, what doesn't work, and um, help you revise, get, shape it, make it better, and go forth and have great successes in, uh, in, other, in other areas as well. Like, uh, we won't talk about the whole development path, we'll just start, we're just gonna talk about festivals tonight. Um, I'm gonna start with well, let me just say that we have Lou Lapardi and Dennis Corsi from the Fresh Fruit Festival, uh, Glory Cadigan from the Planet Connections Festivity and Zoom Fest, uh, correct me if I say anything wrong, um, Van Dirk Fisher from the Jaconda Music Film and Theater Festival, as well as the Reant Theater, which, or Ryan Theater, which does the Strawberry One Act and Strawberry Full Length Play Festivals, uh, and Jean Fish, uh, who is the person that, that makes the New York New Works Theater Festival happen every year. Um, all very different, uh, all serving very different functions. Um, different works will do well in different environments, and we're going to talk about that as well tonight. Um, I'm going to start with Kate Camerata, since Kate uh, works with me on the True Voices play reading series. I want to talk a little bit about how we made a pivot and what we did in the past year and what we're doing. What, what are, we're going to save what we're, we're doing going forward for later. Okay, Kate, hello. Hey, Bob. So my primary job is to be straight man to Bob. And I, <laughs> so, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> that's a great line. I love that. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing I mainly do. No, seriously, I'm the true literary manager. And um, I've been the literary manager since like 2013. Um, only because I recognize, that's my dog, sorry. Um, I recognize that this is such an opportunity to, one, for a producer to get their legs. I was the associate producer on something. And then I produced something, I found it. But then, <laughs> I'm glad you back me up, Jay. He made me laugh. Um, but what an opportunity to get your work out on a stage. I mean, we've done it at um, a group. We've done it at um, presented play reading series or the musical reading series at Soho Playhouse. What are some of the other venues that we've done? Actors play, uh, actors uh, Act temp temple, temple um, uh, the, and the theater at St. Luke's. Um, yeah. We have a long history of of, of uh, producing around. <laughs> so not only do you have a chance to have your work produced on a legitimate stage, we also give you the money. And um, that is wonderful. And you're vetted by the process of having three industry readers read many times, not just once, not just twice, but many times over the years. I have somebody that reads a play and like they, they say, I wanna direct this. It happens again this season. Or I wanna produce this. Even if it doesn't go anywhere after that, you know, after the festival is over, can you please introduce us, make these introductions? 
So do you want to get your script in front of a producer? That's part of our process. And as I said, True as a nonprofit also will give you the money to have a reading. I have to jump in and say, I want everybody to know, if, if you don't already know, that we used to be funded by uh, NISCA and DCA. And um, NISCA stayed, stayed true to us for quite a, quite a while, like 10, 12 years. DCA kind of was over us in five years or something. And we, we also got some discretionary funds from the city count from one of the city council members. Um, so that helped us go for a while. But after NISCA stopped funding us and then and DCA stopped funding us, I had to actually basically say uh, to myself and to, 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 my, to my conscience, hey, we can't spend money we, that we don't have. So we stopped doing the play reading series. Um, and uh, the only reason we were able to, well, two things led to us bringing it back. And oddly enough, one was COVID. Um, but the other one was R.K. Green, who came in and said, I've done nine plays over the years with you guys. Um, you, can't, you can't stop doing this. You have to do it. And he underwrote the, 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 uh, the series last year. Now, the um, play reading series, Don Nolan also helped us out for the musical reading series in 2019. So we do have generous benefactors within our community that will help. But we were not able to figure out how to affordably do musicals online. Hold on, sorry. Um, we, we, were, we weren't able to do musicals online, so basically, uh, we haven't we haven't done the musical series yet. So, but we, what we did was the, the the pivot I wanted to talk about was the fact that when COVID hit, um, I had two reasons not to do this the series. We didn't have any money, and oh God, I don't know how to use Zoom. So I kind of like brushed it off and said, <laughs> "We're not doing this. I don't know what we're going to do this." Now that now that COVID's here and now that we have to do everything virtually, I had no idea what we we're going to do. But RK came back to me and he said, "No, no, no, you've got to do this." And because he said that, and because he encouraged us and gave us the money, we figured out how to do Zoom readings. So we've been doing. We did last year uh, on Zoom, and we're doing this year on Zoom as well. Kate, um, I'm, I'm going to let's let's share the wealth a little. Let's let's divide this into to, to the other people. Uh, just a, a, a brief intro intro from everybody else. Um, and then we'll come back and talk and we'll go in, we'll go into the, we'll visit the weeds later. Um, but for now, um, Lou and Dennis, uh, welcome. Talk to us a little bit about fresh fruit. Uh, Lou, you have a, you have seniority, so you can go first. Because you're the executive director. Okay. Yeah, and actually, uh, you know, what would be very interesting for people to hear? What is the relationship? How do you guys work out the, uh, the div division of labor between uh, executive director and artistic director. Um, you can, and both of you, of actually, both of you can t can talk if you want to find a way of talking over each other. <laughs> Lewis, <laughs> go all ahead. the time. <laughs> See, <laughs> um, division of labor is, is a strange, very strange uh, concept. When I'm working on our grant uh, materials. I have to come up with how much time is spent on what uh, facet of the of the programming, uh, how much is administrative, how much is artistic, person. I'm sure you're in those days, Bob. Uh, uh, so uh, it's always a, a quandary for me. Is Miss doing very much administrative and artistic work, uh, as it always happens with us. Uh, everybody has to just bend and do, you know do whatever needs to be done and so we tend to appear together on these things because it was sort of like those mink dogs you have the old dog and the young dog together I forget what they're called um but we've been around so long you know, we the old old the, dog uh, and the new react. tricks i don't know <laughs> yeah, something like that uh, so we have the geometric wing that me and we have the nerd, which is dennis and uh, between the two of us we get things done Dennis, what is your what is your take on on it? What, what how, Lou is really Lou, Lou really is the festival. He's you know you he you've been with it since the, since the beginning, haven't you, Lou? Yeah, from two thousand two. 
Dennis, you came on board late, so t- tell us. Yeah, a bit. so well, I I follow Lewis's lead for the most part. I I came on in November of 2019, so not that long ago, and um, for the most part, everything that the Fresh Fruit Festival would normally have done has not happened under my time as artistic director because the pandemic threw all of that out. Um, so I. For in, since Lewis has been around for a long time, I've mostly still been in the the phase of like um, learning from him what the festival has done and how it does things in the past. Although because of this year being so different, um, things have not been, we haven't been able to do things as we have in the past. So we've sort of together, Lewis and I have created what our virtual programming has been over this past year, which has been a mix of some of the stuff we did before, but making it virtual and some completely new types of things that we've never done before. So we'll talk more about that. I want to, I want to get to to the other panelists as well. I, I, I'm beginning to my structure, my my head is beginning to structure again. I I don't know if you guys know it, but I, I couldn't get into zoom to open the room. So I was like starting with something flustered, but here I am. Um, Glory, Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, I, I, you were in my living room when you first were conceiving of the Planet Connections Festival. I remember this. Do you remember sitting in my living room and talking about it? You don't. <laughs> no, but that's okay. I do. <laughs> but, I'm, but I remember you around in the early days. Yeah, well, because we both sort of sprung off of the Midtown International Theater Festival, um, we knew each other from that. And I remember you having a conversation with me about, about your plans for the festival before it happened. And, and you made it happen. So by the way, congratulations on, on, on making it happen for how many years now? Uh, 12. Mm. So tell us a little bit about uh, how that started and why you, why you do it. And t- what, what is your, actually, what is your uh, your infrastructure is do you have a do you do you used to do it all then you have now you have a team of people that help you don't you um yeah i've tried different things over the years you know we've experimented with what the infrastructure is um but uh yeah even now i guess we have four staff members and myself so yeah. And tell us a little, not everybody knows you necessarily. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what your, what your mission is and what, what the shows are that come to you. Uh, Well, we're mainly a home for activist artists and uh, all of the productions in the festival partner with a different charitable organization. I can tell you that several ears in the room perked up when they heard that. Um, yeah, it goes in and out of style to be an activist artist. So we've got some, some activists. We have like, several activist needed. artists with us. <laughs> just just but, so you know, the, we have we have we have several of them who, who identify as activist artists who are here. Yeah, there wasn't really anything for that when I got to the city. Um, there wasn't anybody doing that, and I realized that I wanted to be in a community of other activist artists, and so that's what we uh, did. So every production. Um, that presents with us partners with a different charitable organization. So over the years, we've raised money and awareness for all sorts of organizations like Safe Horizons, Ali Forney Center, Planned Parenthood, I mean, on and on. There's uh, literally over 300 organizations we've partnered with. So um, yeah, and uh, we used to do about 50 shows a year, 40 full productions and 10 staged readings. Um, so we did that for 10 years. And now we're doing, um, you know, more full seasons and kind of a smaller, more curated type of festival, I think is what's going on. We'll, t- we'll talk more about that. We'll get more into the details of that. Um, now, uh, Dennis and, and Lou, did you, did you want to say anything more specific about Fresh Fruit? We all know that it's a queer festival. so Well, yeah, it's a queer festival. Um, I think that's important to say. <laughs> so we serve queer artists, um, LGBTQ+. Um, our, our, our main stage festival is typically in the summer. 
Um, and we do that at the Wild Project in the East Village. Um, and then in addition to that, we do other smaller things throughout the year. We usually do a developmental play reading series. We do a poetry slam. Um, and sometimes we, we curate uh, events around other types of art, um, like photography um, or film, uh, things like that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Jean because Jean's Jean does a very specific uh, festival. Uh, Jean, do you want to give us a little bit of, about New York New Works Theater Festival? Um, sure. It's actually pivoted a little bit uh, through the pandemic, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, talk get about the, we'll get to the pivot pivot first. Yeah. Talk, first, talk about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I think you know I started under a bit of a different. Each year, I try and go in to do something that's fun and exciting for me, and I try and. I'll look at other things and I'll try and take the best pieces of each. Um, in this case, I've been to many of the other festivals here and I think they're all great. I mean, I'm friends with pretty much most of these people who are uh, running other festivals. And um, I, I did see a couple of obstacles from a cost perspective when I first thought of this. So what I started doing was I would rent out whatever theater Nymph was at. Um, you know, they were at, uh, they were at the Duke Theater, then they moved to Theater Row. And so I, I would rent out those theaters and I would try and subsidize a large portion of the costs. So, you know, at the time, Nymph might be $6,000 to enter. And I think I was about like 600 or something like that. So I would try and subsidize it for a tax deduction. And in doing so, I was showing abbreviated versions of many of the shows. So they could all be during prime time. I would show like one act or a half an hour of the best parts of a show. And because they were abbreviated and at such a nice facility, we were able to bring in a pretty good, pretty good cadre of Broadway folks. So our festival was really for the folks who you've had your table reads, you've, you've put up a show a couple of times, that's this show. And, you know, now you're ready to you know, put your best foot forward and have it in front of like a group of people who might be able to take it to the next level. And that's really how it started. And it's been great. I mean, I, I have to tell you, it's one of the best parts of my year. And how many years have you done that? Seven. But I did, uh, I mean, last year was very different for obvious reasons. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, taking out last year, I guess six. Okay. So, um, my, my plan is basically to go through the history of, of all the theaters and basically what you what it is you're looking for. Uh, then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what happened on April on uh, March 15th for, for you. OK, so we're going to I'm going to turn to Van Dirk Fisher, um, the multi hyphenated uh, Van Dirk Fisher. Uh, tell us a little bit about, well, all all the different things you do uh, and what what was what, what has been pre pre COVID. And uh, was Jaconda pre-COVID as well? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, I'm sorry. Unmute yourself. Well, I started the Strawberry One Act Festival in 1995 when we had our um, theater at um, the Rian Theater located at 161 Hudson Street. And at that time, we were pretty much subsidizing all of the shows. You know, we gave them rehearsal space. We did everything for them pretty much. Um, and then I made it pretty much a competition where we would give the best play um, a cash prize of 1500 as well as a development deal where they can develop the play that they had written or they can have, you know, decide to do a completely new play. And then after 9-11, we, you know, you know, no, 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 uh, we ended mean, up moving on. Say you that mean, again? You mean, you mean COVID or 9-11? No, 9-11, oh, you know, because we started in 1995. Oh, wow. So after 9-11, okay. you know, we, um, you know, we had a big fire, the owner sold the building. And then I pretty much, you know, liked the idea of just renting out theaters whenever we were doing the festival. Because it almost was like when we were running the space, it was nonstop year round. If we weren't producing, we were renting the space to the theaters. But um. After that, you know, we were doing the, the festival at least twice a year. Um, it was open to all different types of plays. We still were doing the short plays, 15 to 30 minutes and offering a prize. When we did the longer plays, it was a different story, you know, but they were plays up to 90 minutes, musicals, all types. Um, and then um, 
you know, we are still inviting industry people for the uh, finals, which a lot of plays got picked up in terms of being, you know, presented as a tour or other um, producers wanting to make the shorter plays into full lengths, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was a pretty good thing. And then um, I guess, you know, doing, you want me to talk about the uh, pivot situation or? Yeah, I think, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll let you start with the pivot and I'll, then we'll move, we'll move through the other others as well. But um, yeah, what, what happened when the universe sent, sent you to your room to think? <laughs> uh, well, really what happened with us, you know, the thing is, you know, I know like there were like 10 theaters, I believe, that end up shutting down in New York City as a result of, you know, the shutdown of the whole, um, the COVID situation. In our situation, I was lucky that we didn't have uh, a home that we were paying rent on, but we still had administrative office. We had other bills, et cetera. And, you know, a lot of our costumes, props and sets are in storage. So we still had bills to pay. And fortunately, there were a lot of actors who, who were, you know, who were doing films or theater shows or Broadway, and all of a sudden those shows were shut down. And so they wanted to work and they knew our situation and they were willing to, um, to be in the play reading series. Like we had plays that were scheduled to go on for the Jaconda Festival. That was supposed to happen in April. All that got canceled because of- Could, could you do me a favor? Could you, could you help us understand what the Jaconda Festival is versus the Strawberry Festival? I know they're two different things, but- Right. Well, us. the Strawberry Festival is only dealing with plays. The Jaconda Festival, we were also set to um, give a platform and we were paying the, um, the bands and singers who were going to perform. And then we were also doing screenings of films. So we got submissions of films. We had people who submitted tapes of their music. So we, and then with plays, we had plays that were submitted as well. So we were now giving a platform in all three categories and people were submitting their work in all three categories. And I was then selecting which material was going to be presented. So if I were a writer, how would I know whether my, my work was right for Jaconda Festival or, was, or would be better for the, for the Strawberry Festival? Um, well, the, well, the thing is the Jaconda Festival, I was also teaming up with Artel Hotel. So that was the whole thing. And I wanted to have, um, Jaconda means Riant also. The thing is I was teaming up with Artel and I was going to be bringing all of those three elements to that location. So I wanted it to have its own identity, but at the same time for people who, who look into the meaning, they would know it still was the Rian Theater. So I wanted to, it to be a standalone by itself. So that's why I called it Jaconda. But it still means Rian, jubilant, you know, jovial, cheerful, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the, you know, and I guess the other difference is that we were now also presenting film as well as you know, musicians, you know, bands and singers. So we were expanding what we were offering. Artel is a place that has 122 rooms and at very reasonable prices. They had just opened that February before everything was shut down in March. So it was a pretty good situation, you know. Um, I was getting a good deal because I was also getting a percentage of any bookings for the hotel rooms, you know. And we were bringing in music as well as film. And it was a good deal because I wasn't having to pay rental. You know, the only thing I was paying for was um, the fees for the bands and singers who were going to perform. Well, that and, will create a wave of jealousy among among other festivals. Well, you, know, the, the, you know, but it's still venues, a venues I mean, is like the like one of the biggest burdens uh, of running a festival. Yeah, the rental is a big thing, but at the same time, it wasn't, you know, when I look back at it, the amount of money I was putting out to pay the bands to perform, whether it was 15 minutes or an hour, that was a lot of money to lay out for the amount of bands that were scheduled to perform. I mean, usually if you're bringing something to a venue that's also bringing in vendors and, and people are also booking hotels, because like with a festival, we get people from all over the country and sometimes people from all over the world. You know, so London. In, in, you know, a, in, a, in, a, in a sentence or two or three, can you tell us what kind of works? You got a room full of playwrights. I mean, a lot of the people in the room are, are they're, they're writers and they want to they know where their work will be suited, best suited. 
the, I'm pretty much open to giving artists an opportunity. If it's good work, you know, I don't care if it's something experimental because I was into doing experimental theater as well. Um, so I'm pretty much open to any type of plays. Um, that's pretty much it. You know, if, if it's a good play, I'll give it a chance. You know, but I realize sometimes when you're reading a play and you have other people read it, you may miss something. You know, you just may not get it. Doesn't mean it's not a good play, because I've seen some plays that I've turned down and have gone to a reading or performance someplace else. And I was like, wow, you know, I loved it. So, you know, I'm pretty much open if in giving the artist a chance and a platform to see their work done. Because, you know, really in the end, I've, I've read great plays that, you know, the director may have had their boyfriend or girlfriend directed. You know, the playwright may have had their boyfriend or girlfriend direct and they weren't a good director. Or they may have cast the play with somebody who wasn't mature enough to bring the different elements that were necessary. So sometimes it's, it depends on the creative team that you put together. You know, sometimes it could be a hit or miss. And it's so, not because the play wasn't good. So, so I'm me, pretty open. Okay, well, that, no, that's, that's, that's good. That, that's good for people to know. Um, I, what I want to say, and if I'm wrong about any of your festivals, you tell me, but uh, what, what, uh, what the room needs to understand, uh, that there, there, there are no necessary limitations in terms of what you can do in, in people's festivals, um, but you, you will be, you will be self-producing usually in, in, in any of these situations. Um, Gloria, is that still still true with with Planet Connections? It depends, you know. In some situations, yes; in other situations, no. So the expectation in going into any of these festivals is that you you have to be doing something that you can actually afford and and have the the resources to create. Uh, somebody's asking me at what what about cast size? Cast size doesn't matter to any of these people that are here. It could be any cast size that you want. It's it's just what is what is doable within the the resources that they're able to offer you. Um, what then the offer the resources that they usually are able to offer. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Is basically a venue and um, some there's usually some marketing support that happens uh, and uh, I don't know <laughs> pats on the back uh, encouragement. Um, let's I've, let's. I've yeah, somebody had a question. We do. Um... We do allow musicals to be in the festival as well. Um, and, you know, regular plays as well. Um, yeah, Elizabeth Layton had her play in the, uh, the George Floyd thing. Yeah, that was very powerful, guys. And we um, made it available for people to see even after the uh, 31st of May. Um, but, um, you know, with the short plays, we, we still give out the cash prize of $1,500 and a development deal if they decide to want to produce it more. With the longer plays, we, you know, allow them to um, share in the box office. You know, they buy into it, whether they want 10%, anywhere from 10% to 100% of the box office. Um, they can pay for whatever level they want to share in the box office. So we offer that as well. Um, I'm going to come back to questions, but I want to I want to basically get the same information from everyone else. So Dennis and Lou, in terms of the Fresh Fruit Festival, I know that since I've been in the festival, I know what some of these answers are. But um, what what do you provide? What do, what do they bring? Well, uh, the, the, one of the big things we provide is the holding, uh, the technical support. We provide the technicians, the uh, a lot of help in fact we completely staff the booth when we do live production uh, so that's the big one uh, the publicity we have for the festival itself we have about a two thousand dollar publicity budget and that goes to promote everyone but we expect to see uh, the incoming productions have a fair amount of their own uh, publicity uh, we insist that they have a publicist uh, that they hire. Uh, we have a list that we recommend of people we know. They don't have to pick from our list, but they have to pick somebody who's professional. Um, music is a big thing. When we do musicals in the festival, it's not our main thing, but we always do at least one. And we do them at a pretty high level. And because of that, 
we've had the performing rights organizations, BMI and ASCAP, down our neck many times. So we do this that it be original music, and if it's not original music, you have to have control of the right, not just uh, have licensed it. Well, that's ba that's basically true no matter where, where you guys are going to go. I mean, you, um, th those right. of you who don't already know about licensing and, and the, the, the importance of licensing, you can't just use music. I mean, even if it's just I introductory music to set the, the mood for for a show, uh, you legally can't do that without getting getting the rights to it. Um, so uh, something the... I want to add, um, uh, something that uh I want to bolster what we're offering is more um, dramaturgical support and just overall mentorship for mm -hmm. the the teams that produce uh, at the Fresh Fruit Festival because they're often new plays. The festival is usually the first time it's being put up on stage. Um, so providing more support in that area is something that I'm I'm hoping that we can bolster in what we do. Um, we did offer dramaturgs to all of our, when we did our reading series last year, we provided dramaturgs for each of the, um, each of the playwrights. Well, True's li literary manager, Kate Camerata, is a dramaturg, so we provide yes. dramaturgical input yeah. too. Kate, do you want to talk a little bit about, about what we offer? You, see, you went into it a little bit earlier, some of it. Right, so um, I actually don't read all the plays until the 10 finalists. But what the opportunity is to get you play into a, uh, the hands of professionals in the New York theater. And then if you interview the 10 finalists, then more people read your plays. And then the five finalists, that was the 10 semi-finalists and the five finalists, then we actually introduce you to a producer that likes your work. And then since we have a lot of producers in training, um, I've been insisting that they also have an associate producer because that's the way I got my wings is by um, learning from someone else. So I think it's all, it's a really good business model. And as I said before, we give you all of the money. If you want to enhance it, that's your choice, but you don't have to, but you do have to have it come in at 90 minutes. And as Bob and I can both tell you that once your work is um, pretty much trimmed down to its essence in 90 minutes, very few people ever add the extra back in. I, I want to say that the first play in our series, Tiny Empty Nest, they were in total crisis mode because the play was running two hours and they were just tearing their hair, hair out and they couldn't figure out what they were going to do. And I, I kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut it off at 90 minutes. And they um, they were freaking out, freaking out, and they trimmed and they, they edited and they presented it. And it went really well on set Sunday, and the playwright said, you know what, this play works better at 90 minutes than it did at, at two hours. And he's not, he's not making any, he's not putting those, those cuts back in. Uh, the, the, the thing that, that just, just to state the obvious, we're, we're, we're a reading series. I mean, I snuck us into a festival discussion because, because it's true, it's what we do. Um, so we're not going to, we're not going to give you the opportunity to see a a fully realized production or even a, a, a production realized with minimal production values. Um, but what we, what we do is we, we, we pay it, we pay for everything. And um, the other main thing that we, I think we offer is we offer you a producer. We get you involved in, into a producer writer relationship. Kate, you were going to say something else. I was going to say something um, that if you pay for the feedback, you will get feedback from the industry experts and their take and what they say about you. So. Yeah. So um, uh, let's see, uh, Glory, uh, what, what is, what, what are we talking about now? I'm sorry, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I had such a day. I'm like, my, my, my head is just spinning. Um, we're talking about what their expectations are, what, 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 what you offer them if they come into your festival and we'll, We'll talk about what the submission process is, if there is a submission process later. But for, for now, Gloria, talk a little bit about um, what you offer people. And how does it, I think we also should be talking about the pivot. How did it change on March 15th? Sure, yeah. Well, um, okay, so on March 15th, uh, you know, we had 
several artists. We're more of a community that's been together for a long time. Um, and we had several artists in the community who were opening shows and those closed um, before they opened and people were very depressed. And so I just said, you know, sort of flippantly like, oh, we'll just put it online. We'll just do that. And uh, <laughs> before I knew it, you know, it was, uh, I guess we ended up doing 47 different online productions because I did a couple artists and then more artists were like, what about me? And then I just decided, okay, we'll go through the winter because people are depressed during the winter and they're isolated with the pandemic. And so we only just kind of broke from that maybe about a month or so ago. Um, and it was really interesting for me to see the online productions. Of so it went, it went beyond winter. Oh yeah, it was just weeks and weeks of it. Every week we did a new show, you know? Um, in terms of what we provide and don't provide, uh, I mean, everyone keeps pressing me to go back online, but I don't think I wanna go back online right now. I think I wanna go live. Um, but, you know, we'll see, we'll see. I could change my mind in the winter again, who knows? Uh, but in terms of what we provide when we're live, um, I think it's, um, you know, the same things that other people provide, the venue, uh, tech staff, box office staff, press, marketing, that type of thing. Um, in terms of whether or not we're going to fund your actors and designers and those types of people, um, at this point, I'd say sometimes we do do that if you are hiring from the community. So we do kind of have a stipulation, even with our renowned playwrights, that if they want us to do it, then they need to hire from the community of actors and designers, um, you know, which might loosely, I mean, I don't like to use the word company actors and designers, uh, but if, if it helps you to think of it like that. Um, but you know, well, no, we're community still, is a good word. Community sounds a little less formalized than company. what it is. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think for people who just have their own people and they want to do their own thing, that's cool too. And we're open to new people. Um, and that's fine. It's just we're not going to be funding you in, in the same way, but you're welcome to come aboard in a different type of financial arrangement. And um, yeah, we're going to have a big reunion party in October and everybody's invited who's here, everybody who's invited who's in the room. Um, and, you know, you can come on by and say hello and, and we can talk about things. So um, we're gonna to get to Van Dirk and, and Jean, uh, Jean in a moment. I just wanna say that I was expecting, I was expecting more, uh, more traumatic s stories. For me, it was traumatic. When, when, when we went into lockdown, I went into despair. I just didn't know what to do. I, I mean, I thought I was, I thought I was being a slacker because it took me two weeks to pull myself out of despair. But if, I'm told that we that we we responded relatively quickly. But I mean, my, my God, didn't anybody feel anything about the fact that we were in shutdown and we 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 all were used to making theater happen and suddenly suddenly it's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We we don't have we don't have live theater. What are we going to do? Well, did did know, anybody have that moment? In our case, we didn't have time to think about it because we still had bills to pay. So it wasn't like we could sit and twiddle our thumbs and just like do nothing. We had to do something. So what I did was some of the plays that had already been selected for the Jaconda Festival or the Strawberry One Act Festival, I asked the playwrights if they would be interested in doing their plays online. And then the wonderful thing that happened was that, you know, there were a lot of actors all over the country who now their productions that they were supposed to do, whether it was film or television or Broadway, now had nothing to do. And they were willing to help us out because they knew we still had bills to pay. And they were willing to work for free to be in these plays and they loved the work. Sometimes I directed, sometimes the playwrights had their own director. And it became a nice community for people to work and we did the talk back afterwards and people enjoyed that because a lot of people were sheltering in place. So having the opportunity to- A lot of people, I hope everybody was. Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of, you know, everybody, you know, and so it gave people, a, you know, sometimes the talkbacks will last longer than the play because people liked having 
people to talk to. Well, there's a new piece of information. New piece of information. So you, you, so you follow. So when you created your online readings, you always you followed them with talkbacks. Right, always. We that's something that's interesting to, to to mention. Yeah, the talkback. You know, this because the thing is. If you're doing a reading, and then also what I did when I was directing, and then after a while, people were expecting that same thing. We had virtual backgrounds. So, and then also I made sure that the actors, if, like right now, you see the panelists. If you're on, you know, if you're on camera, then you had to make sure you're reacting to what's being said. Because if you're not, it's almost like you're not there. So it wasn't like a reading where people are sitting at a, you know, standing at a music stand and reading a script. They were acting and reacting. You know, they were listening, responding. They were alive. And seeing the different backgrounds, the comments we got was that it made it easier for the audience to follow the scene changes. And then also seeing the reactions of the people who were in the scene, it made it feel to them, like they were getting a front row seat and they were watching a movie or a film. Gene, so tell us, tell us about your tell us about your moment of despair. Did you have one? Am I the only one? Me and Kate were the only two. <laughs> no, you have to take yourself off mute. Would you like me to talk about what we offer and then pivot into the, what our moment of despair was, or do you want me to just go into the moment of despair? Go into the moment of despair and then talk about what you now offer. How did you how did you resolve that? I mean, the moment of despair for me, um, I still wanted to appreciate a tax deduction, um, which is one of the reasons I started the festival, because I'd rather give my money to the arts and to kids than to the government. So for me, I had to think of ways. So what we did was we did several virtual uh several virtual performances. And then what we would do is we would have the playwrights, there was no charge, um, and we would have the playwrights pick a charity uh, that was important to them. And then the people that I would normally invite to see their shows to hopefully invest in their shows would now be investing into their favorite charities. So our pivot was in that regard, and I guess we didn't do a, it wasn't a critical mass, but we did a few and it, it aggregated to about 15 or $16,000. and. You know, that was good. So all the playwrights, they would say what their charity was and any revenues, we didn't touch the revenues. It would go directly to like the payment system that was set up online. It would go directly to the charity that they selected. So it was, it turned out great. And I guess pivoting into what we do, um, I mean, obviously the same as everyone, you know, we do a theater. Um, I try and get a 199 seat theater in the Broadway box or very close to the Broadway box. Um, as of late, the last few years, I've hired like a Broadway level GM team to make everything all work the way it should. And then I think most importantly, and I can never make any promises, but I'll throw a couple of parties. Let's just call them what they are. Um, I'll throw a few parties at uh, local areas and I'll bring in um, a whole bunch of like producer friends and I had a meeting just today, actually, um, you know, one of our shows is about halfway to Broadway and, you know, the producer friends in this case, it's Van Dean, who I think Bob knows we were at the wedding together and um, Gail Waxenberg, who's done quite a bit of producing. Who Bob knows. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's right. She's a member of True, I believe, yes. um, you know, and, you know, they attach themselves to one of the shows. I try and make it a community where it's not like where people just come and leave because so much feedback that I get at the end of each performance is, oh, I liked that. And see, for me, that was one of the obstacles I saw when I would go visit friends in other, in other organizations and performing in different spaces. Like the people would go and they would never see many of these people again. So I try and cultivate, I really make an effort anyway, I think I do, to cultivate those relationships and you know, in that case, Van and Gail attached themselves to a show and, you know, it's about halfway to Broadway. It's doing really well. And, and that's happened across the board for several of our folks. So, you know, I, I can't make any promises in that regard. And I have to be very, very careful how I talk yes. about that. But at least I try, you know, and we're putting it in a good space and we're, we're cultivating the community of feedback. And, you know, there are so many times that People do like the work. I can think of a dozen off the top of my head. But let me let me re let me reiterate because I'm not sure whether I'm not sure whether the uh, whether the point was was gotten by everybody. You don't present the full work. You present 
up to a, like a 30 minutes or whatever, whatever your time, 30 minutes of the work. So people who submit to you have to be prepared to find a way of doing their work in 30 minutes or showing 30 minutes of their work that will be representative of enough so that people will understand what the full, will be interested in the full work. Is that correct? Historically, yes. Uh, this year, no. But historically, yeah, I would do 30 minutes. Uh, I would do 30 minutes because honestly, and I think everyone in the room can appreciate this. If you've ever been to a reading, especially a reading of someone you don't know, you know, it's hard to dedicate an entire afternoon to spend two hours listening to their work when you really can tell inside of five or 10 minutes whether or not it's something that resonates with you and you'd like to kind of pursue and, and you can kind of gauge. So yeah, historically, it's typically about 30 minutes. Um, can I, will I, can say, I also just, Jean, can I say, that's basically not from an audience point of view, that's from a producer point of view. So, so yes. the writers understand that we're, we're not talking about, now the audiences, the audiences will gladly engage with you for, for 90 minutes or two hours. I mean, all of us have had audiences that have stuck with oh, yeah. readings. I'm talking but it's the for producers. Yeah. I'm talking investment. And I think that's one of the reasons I always used to hear, oh, I can't get anyone to come see my show. I can't get anyone to come see my show. And it was just a solution that I thought, I'd say you roll the dice and take a chance. And it happened to work out quite well. Um, but just to, to the point of this year, we actually opened yesterday, our first show, we opened up at the Paramount Theater and 1,100 seats. Um, almost, I mean, we piled in people. It was amazing. What, and what we, first show? What did you do in 1,100 seats? Ah, see, <laughs> I didn't want to talk about the future. Um, I actually posted it on Facebook and I never post on Facebook, but uh, we, we put up a show and we, we let the playwright, uh, the, the show is benefiting a foundation that mentors children uh, with Broadway caliber artists and professionals. And, um, you know, we raised 100% of the proceeds went to that foundation. So it was a lot of fun. Okay, that's, we're going to have to come back and talk about, for the people that are, that are, that are in the room, what, what it is that, they, that, that you have to offer for them. But we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm losing Dennis in seven minutes. So Dennis, tell me everything you want to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Fresh Fruit has one of our developmental readings this evening, which is why I have to pop out shortly. Um, uh, well, the, so you're asking right now, the question is about, did we have a panic moment? Did you have a panic moment and how did you do it? How did you deal with it? What, what, what you talked about, you do, it did some virtual programming, but you didn't get specific about it. So, you know, tell, tell us a little bit more. Um, well, I, I personally didn't feel a panic moment because it sort of happened. The realization happened fairly slowly because we were in the process of programming our summer main stage festival. Um, so I had pr basically programmed my first festival. We hadn't committed to anyone officially yet, but had picked the shows that we wanted to do. And then the first shutdown happened and we sort of just thought, okay, let's wait a couple of weeks before giving these offers to writers just so we could see what happens. Well, a couple of weeks passed and we met again and said, I guess we have to wait another couple of weeks. And, uh, and on and on. So eventually it hit a point where we realized that, well, we have to now change. We can't do the main stage festival at the Wild Project the way that we wanted to. So that's why there wasn't so much a panic moment because it was sort of a slow burn for us. Um, so what we did do is we, um, the, the first thing on the calendar that was planned for 2020 was our developmental reading series. <laughs> So we typically do a reading of three plays. Um, and so we simply brought that on Zoom um, as everybody did. Um, so that was fairly uh, normal. Um, and Dennis, then- can you do, me, do me a favor, when you talk about, talk about that, talk about, talk about how, you did, how you used Zoom at first and what you learned and, how, how, and what, how, what changed and how you got better, if you did. Um, so Lewis was, uh, could probably say a lot about the technical elements of it because he put together um, a lot of guidelines and resources for the playwrights and producers in terms of these are, these are the standards that we, we want to hold you to. 
so that there's a certain quality of video and audio. Um, yeah, so Lewis can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I was, I, so I, what, what my day job is as a tutor and I tutor on Zoom, I have for many years. So Zoom to me was a very uh, comfortable environment. So I, I don't feel like there was much of a learning curve for me there because I had already done that. Um, so I felt pretty comfortable bringing us onto Zoom right away. I had to unmute myself. Uh, there was, I had some background noise. Um, okay, so um, the, the other thing is, uh, before you go, um, you, you can, you and Lou, Lou, Lou also, you can both talk to, talk to us about what are your plans going forward and what are the opportunities for people in this room? Um, do, are you taking submissions? Um, when do you think you'll be back? Uh, sure. If, if you're not back until next year, are you gonna be doing virtual stuff? so that they can submit to virtual, you know, all that. Um, so I'll let Lewis talk about what's coming up in the fall because he's leading a, a virtual cool multimedia project we're doing. But I'll say about the future, um, we are planning on resuming the, the main stage in-person festival at the Wild Project in the East Village in the summer of 2022. Um, so submissions for that will open um, at the end, sometime around the end of this year. Um, I don't know the exact date, but look around November. Um, submissions will be on our website, freshfruitfestival.com. Um, it'll be very clear if you go there when submissions are open. Is there a submission fee? There is not a submission fee, no. Um, and, and Lewis can also give some more information about the financial situation of participating in the festival. Um, okay. The one other thing I'll say is that one thing that we did this year was we did a, a series of radio plays. Um, and that was born out of, of course, the pandemic. And that went great. Um, I think they're, they're really great uh, engaging experiences. Um, Lewis did a lot of the audio editing work. He's a great audio editor. Um, and so we loved it. We loved doing it and the product was great. So that's something that we actually hope to continue um, even as we reopen up with doing an in-person festival and in-person readings. We would like to every year continue to do a radio play series. So okay. if anyone has anything that is written specifically for audio only, or if you have any plays that you think would be well adapted to audio only, um, there will be uh, submission opportunities for that as well. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Um, Glory, um, you, you, well, first confess whether you had a moment of panic about, about all this, or, or just like, oh, we're in shutdown. We'll just go on Zoom. Did, how how familiar were you with Zoom? Did, did, did you just did you just jump right into it? Uh, not that familiar. And yes, I just jumped right into it. Um, yeah, I mean, even if I am panicked or feeling out of place, I still have the ability to work and get the job done, and create things and do things. Um, so I guess I wasn't really floundering in that way. But I think also, you know, I've lived in foreign countries. And I think at the point when most people were in a place with the pandemic, I was almost treating it like it was a foreign country. You know, it was like there were some things I liked better about it. There were some things I didn't like as much. But I would live there for a while <laughs> until I got back to home, you know, <laughs> at that point. Um, so I think uh, adaptability you know, I'm very adaptable, um, whatever we're doing. Good for you. you know. So for, tell me about the, the, first, the first Zoom play that you produced uh, as, uh, versus the, the, the ones that you did later on. Did you, did you learn much? What did you learn? Did you change how you did it or you just used the medium? Oh, yeah. Hmm? yeah, it changed a lot over time, of course. Um, it was evolving as an art form as it was going. And so every single week, uh, the artists were inventing something new that I hadn't seen done before with it. Uh, so it's actually kind of exciting to see all of that creativity. Okay. Um, can you give us some 
ideas about what some of the improvements were that you saw? Um, or th yeah. or if, if not improvements, but s some of the technical yeah, tricks. Yeah, people started using different technological things. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it started out where people were just kind of making it look like it was the same glass by passing different glasses, you know, and then it got more elaborate. Directors were shipping costumes and props to people. And then they would like change the camera angle so that you kind of, you know, it's all kinds of things. And then some people had multiple, we did one where we did multiple cameras. Um, so actors were shot from two different cameras simultaneously, uh, kind of interesting. And then, you know, lighting, there was a whole thing with just Christmas lights that were lit. Um, and then actors who were quarantined together doing dance movements and things in the same apartment. Uh, that was re a really beautiful one. And it was all sorts of things. Well, the, 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 uh, the challenge I think was always, as I saw it, and as I told the people that were doing my, my benefit in February, um, can we do something other than talking heads in frames? Yeah. Um, basically, that, that's, that was the challenge, to go beyond talking heads in frames. Um, yeah. So you found ways to do it. Um, Dennis and Lou, Louis, Lou, uh, did you, Lou, you're the tech guy. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, what you knew about Zoom then and what you know about it now. I have to head off to our reading. So I'm going to say goodbye. Um, I'm getting some questions in the chat. So I'm just going to, I'm dropping my email address for anyone who, who needs further questions answered for me. You can reach out uh, via email. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, everybody. If you see, if you see Gene on, on your way out, <laughs> ask Gene if he's coming back. <laughs> oh, I see him. I'm he's right here. here. <laughs> Where are you? I'm Bye, right, guys. Right in front of you. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can find you. You're, you're not. You're not on my screen. Um. Well, you don't see me. No, I don't. Does, does everybody else me? see him? If everybody else sees them, it's fine. I don't know why yeah, he disappeared, we do from see my, him. <laughs> disappeared from my screen completely. Oh, I don't sorry. see him either. There you are. I'm right here. Okay. I'm going there to put you, you back in the spotlight. Now I see you. All right. Um, so uh, let me go back to to Lou for a second. Um, you're, you're a t you actually have a tech background, so you probably understood Zoom a little bit better than I did. <laughs> Well, well, it wasn't a matter of understanding Zoom. It was getting frustrated with the limitations, the technical limitations on Zoom, because Zoom was was uh, primarily a, a visual uh, setup. So they tended to at first ignore the sound until they got many, many complaints, and they uh, upgraded their sound a little bit. They showed people. Uh, they showed people like me how to backdoor their sound system so that you got much better sound quality. But that meant we had to enforce a lot of rules with our uh, virtual productions. And when it came to things like our radio plays, where we were insisting on broad broadcast quality, uh, I had to really push for people to use a specific recording platform uh, which we paid for, and it was basically the same recording platform that the BBC uses for their interviews uh, on the BBC News, and National Public Radio uses it also. And so we paid for uh, the use of that platform so that the people in the radio plays could get very, very high quality sound. And then we jumped in and worked their materials up to a point where uh, it would work as an old time radio and only updated to today's technology. One, one of your fellow technicians wants to know what the yep. BBC News recording platform is. Do, do, do you know what it is? Oh, yeah. Uh, Clearfeed. Clearfeed, okay. It's called Clearfeed, Clean Feed, excuse me. And um, you can use it as, a, as like, like many of the others, at a, at a free level, and you have you know, limited use of the platform, but it's a great way to learn it. And then you can switch to a paid use of it, and it gives you many more features. Um, but if you're used to looking at WAVE on a screen, uh, even in miniature, 
that's the platform for you to use because then you can see right away if somebody's sound is adequate or not, uh, at least on a, a basic level. We also started a study program. As I said, we have a lot of actors, even voiceover actors, who are not used to working at home. So we had a subsidy program where if people were upgrading their equipment in order to do one of our productions uh, or to bring something to us, we would pay a percentage uh, up to 35% of the cost of their new equipment. And people jumped at that. So the people <laughs> in this room, the people in this room who are interested in, in, in being part of the Fresh Fruit Festival, um, the opportunities are, are going to be, they're going to be live uh, in September, but currently are there opportunities for them to, to work with you virtually? Yes, continuing the virtual programming because it was so successful. We have, uh, we call it All Out Arts Net, uh, All Out Arts Network, and we have a YouTube channel and we have a podcast. So we can put sound only things on the podcast, we can put video on the YouTube channel, as we did with our filmed monologues. It was a contest of uh, eight to 10 minute monologues. And that is getting hundreds, to this day, it's getting hundreds of views uh, every month. And I said, this is a great opportunity for artists to advertise themselves. Uh, anyway, we're continuing those on through the fall and next season. We're hoping to be live in the Wild Project, uh, but starting in the, not just the summer. And we're also, we'll also be adding uh, new work on Fresh Fruit Radio. So there's a lot going on uh, all year long, uh, okay, especially good. this coming season. So there are opportunities. It's good for everybody to know. Kate, you talk a little bit, yeah. you can talk for, through, about True Voices or you, or you can talk about Create Theater. Um, create Theater, I think, is, is maybe a, a little bit more illuminating in terms of the the journey that you've, you've t taken through, through Zoom and th using Zoom. What do you mean illuminating? Illuminating, illuminating, like illuminating. the light goes on. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, like people here, I was, um, I was teaching on, on Zoom and I was working with writers on Zoom. Can you go closer to your mic? Sorry. Um, I was teaching on Zoom and I was working on Zoom and it, you know, I got depressed uh, for one day. <laughs> Bobby, you know me. I don't do well with depression. <laughs> so I started calling up some of my writers and I'm like, oh, let's get back on track. We can do this on Zoom. So that's when the Monday night reading series was born. And I think maybe that encouraged Bob that if I could do it, he could do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was drag kicking and screaming. No, basically, uh, my my night of the soul it did i thought it was i thought it was endless but it apparently wasn't that that long i immediately figured out that our main programs were, were panels and that basically doing a panel on on zoom it's not that much different to watch five four talking heads in frames from watching four or five people in the, in the front of the room sitting in chairs looking at you i mean I don't, I don't choreograph my panels. I, there's no direction and there's no exits and ex entrances. So, so that was, that was pretty easy. I immediately figured out how to do that. And once, once somebody had held my hand and, and convinced me that that was possible to do, which was our, that was our first panel. That was the end of April in 2020. And that was Gretchen Cryer and John Cryer and, and uh, all these solo artists talking about creating uh, solo art and moving it into Zoom. Um, Actually, Bob, can I give a quick shout out on this? Um, yeah. I have to say, you know, I've seen a number of Kate's productions and I, I've seen one of Glory's productions. Um, and I have to say, both of them like kill it. Like I, I uh, watching Kate's productions evolve to where they are and, and the production I saw of Glory's both did such a tremendous job utilizing that medium. Um, it's not for me, like it's not something I'm going to attempt to do uh, on a long term, but both of them have really done a fantastic job of pulling it together. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. No problem, okay. um, what I was going to say yeah. is that the value of taking it online was initially just to keep the community going because we need an audience. And if we couldn't be together, 
we could have an audience to test out the text, to text out changes as we went along. And it was to keep us going mentally, spiritually, artistically. And I think it served its purpose in doing that. You know, will I continue to have online readings? Probably because I like having a community that's coast to coast and a developed audience that are interested in um, watching plays evolve. But should theater, in my opinion, be back on stage? Yeah, I think it should be. And just to state the obvious, the, the, the other advantage of Zoom that, that, that we all, I think we all love, is the fact that people who are nowhere near New York City can actually be with us. Uh, we get audiences from Australia, London, Malaysia, Barcelona, uh, East Coast, West Coast, um, waiting, waiting for somebody to, from Hawaii to, to, to come on. I haven't seen anybody from Hawaii yet. Um, so we don't want to lose that. Van Dirk, talk about your, your journey. What, what was your learning curve with, with Zoom, uh, moving everything into... Uh, 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 clarify this for me, because I, I forget whether you said this or not. Were you, were you using virtual medium before the pandemic? And this was just a yeah, natural... Yeah, um, I'm a part of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. So we also had um, a business referral group. So we were already, you know, once things shut down, we were already using Zoom before you know, we decided to use it for the theater. So I was already familiar with a lot of different aspects of, of how to you know, spotlight people, to pin people and stuff like that. So the transition wasn't that difficult for me because I had already been using it for like over a month already. But um, you know, the, the, the main thing that I liked about it was the quality of actors that we were able to attract from all over the country, who um, a lot of them were in a se you know were in several plays as a result of liking the quality of the plays and the actors, and then they would refer other actors to us. You know, we got a lot of actors who have done a lot of major films as well as Broadway, who weren't doing anything, and they loved what we were doing, and they would refer other people. Like we had Emmy award-winning actors who was working with us, and they all had a great spirit of just wanting to do good work and to be in a nice community of other people who were there for the same reason. You know, we had one guy who said he made most of his money from television and film, but he wanted to do theater, you know, so he wasn't concerned about being paid. He just wanted to do good work and work with good people. And tell us, uh, some, summarize for us a little bit about your, your submission process. And I, I know that there's a cost uh, to submit yeah, that's one thing I changed because with the Strawberry One Act Festival, you know, initially I was letting people submit two plays. And um, and then when it got time to book people, you know, I'm putting the whole schedule together. And then some people would change their mind about wanting to be in the festival. And so I felt like I was wasting time reading their play, scheduling their play, and then they would change their mind. And I had one act, one playwright who was bold enough who submitted his play a second time. And then I saw in his, like maybe the second page of his script, he was using the fact that his play had been accepted by the festival as if it was, you know, like an honor for him when he's submitting it to other festivals. So I was like, you know, you're wasting my time, you know, having me read your play and you're not really serious about being in the festival. So I said, let me charge a fee because if you're not serious, you're not gonna submit. And that eliminated a lot of people. And then it also saved me in terms of wasting my time reading their play and then scheduling their play if they weren't serious about performing their play. And for me, that's worked out very well. Okay, and the thing that everybody has, has to remember that these are opportunities for you to, to bring in your work. And um, you, you, you uh, this, is, this is the time, for the, the cue for me to, to to actually t talk about our producer development program. Uh, we encourage, True has always encouraged writers and artists to understand the business. And I've always, one of the reasons I started True was because I was waiting for somebody to produce me for years. And then one day I said, you know what? I'm just gonna raise some money and I'm gonna put my show up. And it was successful. And it's like, oh, I guess other people can do that too. So uh, you know, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get writers to understand that you, you know you can be proactive, you can have some control, you can empower yourself. Um, but you know to... what, Bob? One one thing I wanted to say, which I started letting I did a whole um, 
Zoom thing that I recorded is that, you know, some playwrights, um, you know, in terms of doing a play on your, on your own, like if you're in New York City, renting some of these theaters can be anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 a week. And a lot of people want to do their play. They, you know, they want to do at least 12 or 16 performances. Just renting the space alone for your own play can be very expensive. A lot of theaters, all the lights are on the stage. So you have to have a lighting designer who's going to then hang your lights and then someone who's going to then do your light plot and all of that. So you have to also look at the budget of what you have to do your play. And then some playwrights don't think about who's going to want to see their play. Like it could be a vanity production, you know, or, you know, they haven't really thought about who would want to see this particular play. So some of the benefits of being in a festival is that, you know, we're already taking care of the theater course. We're already taking care of the lighting course. And so, and then also we do publicity as well for all the plays that are in the festival. So you're piggybacking on a lot of the services and there is a participation fee, but it's nowhere near what you would pay if you were doing it on your own. Absolutely. And a lot of times these plays do get picked up by producers who want to then take it to the next level. In, in the, then, the, usual, the usual festival model, the, the festival is basically renting a, a theater space for a, num a certain number of weeks. And within those number of weeks, multiple shows are getting to be, be produced. So whereas if you were just doing your play, you would be spending... I've seen I've seen space for as little as twenty twenty eight hundred dollars, but twenty eight hundred to to eight thousand I think is 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 where I would sort of put what your what your um, rental your venue rental is going to be, and th that's that's nothing compared to as, as some some festival where you're where you're paying five hundred or six hundred dollars to participate. Um, I, I don't know what yours what, whether you have participation fees or not, but some festivals do. And um, it, it, it is worth it. It's, it's, you just have to, you have to, you have to weigh the, the pluses and minuses for yourself. Um, the, uh, the other thing about festivals is there's going to be limited numbers of performances. If you're going to produce yourself on your own, then there's no limitation. You can do what the, the equity, if you're doing, if you're back to equity showcases live again, if they're what they used to be, and I don't know if they will be, um, then you basically were able to do 12 performances uh, sometimes expand it to 16 performances. Um, what do you need? Can you learn what you need to learn in three or four performances in a festival? Um, in many cases, yes. Uh, do you need a, 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 great, a longer run? So, okay, maybe you need to start thinking about spending a lot more money um, to produce yourself as, a, as an independent showcase rather than within a festival. But they're just, it's options, guys. It's just options. You as, a, as an artist, who's wearing a businessman's hat has to start thinking about what your options are and what the pluses and the minuses are um, and just make decisions that are best for you and for your work. Um, so uh, I, I want to open this up to, to questions from the room because we, we only have 10 more minutes. So guys, do you know how to do your hand, the hand raise? Um, or I can unpin everybody and, and people can come into the room and just randomly talk. Anybody want to, anybody have a question? I'm looking. I don't see any hand raises. Do you know what a virtual hand under re, there's reactions along the bottom of your of your screen if you're on a, a Mac or a, lap, a laptop or a, a desktop? Uh, on the far left, it says mute. On the far right, it says end. Sort of towards the right, you're going to see something that says reactions. Um, anybody? Da uh, OK, uh, Lou, you wanted to say something. So I see your hand is raised. Yeah. Um... I have to leave momentarily uh, to get the same reading that uh, Dennis dashed out to. Um, I promised the author I would be there. It's a very unusual reading for us. It's a queer Asian demonic possession story. I think. Not oh, another. I have to be there. <laughs> have to be there. <laughs> yeah. So I can't miss this one. Okay. So I'm going to run and. You, know, you can find out more about us on the website freshfruitfestival.com and I was part of the festival fun. in 2014 and it was a wonderful experience. I did a musical in their in their in the festival yep. and I just uh, I, it was one of one of the most positive experiences I've had. Uh, I had a, a lot to do with with the creative team as well. It, it, the, but the festival was very accommodating and Lou was great to work with. Um, so uh, I highly re recommend it guys. Um, if you have an LBGTQ 
element op uh play mm -hmm. um okay <laughs> okay uh next ha hand raises dan dan you, you wanted to ask a question uh yes um are you hearing me all right just make sure yes. my mic is on okay great um first of all thank you this has been a fantastic uh bit of enlightenment for a newbie and uh i just want to thank you all for that my my question might be a little naive but it's this when i wrote my books my agent was able to shop it around even before they were completely finished got a good deal uh, if you're writing a screenplay, you can do a treatment, an outline, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm getting the feeling that in this world, in the world of the theater, you've got to come in hand with a complete finished script, production, all the information, et cetera, et cetera. Is that the case? Or like Gene did mention a 30 minute kind of thing. Is that something that would be less than a completed, fully written idea that you spend months on for somebody to maybe tell you, no, you wasted your time? Um, I mean, I can, I, I can, put my opinion out there if you'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, essentially, the, the thing with theater that makes it so great is it's always evolving. So I, I think you can start off in front of one audience and find out what works and polish it and polish it and polish it. And then the goal is to eventually find it in front of the right group of people that can help elevate it to another level. Um, you can look at an outline which is great, uh, you know, on paper, but then when you bring it out into, you know, the world, there's so many pieces of a two hour show that are going to be stronger than others and weaker than others. And you always want to be progressing those. I think the reason I do a half an hour, I think the one act festivals, as long as the show has the beginning, a middle and an end, um, if it's a musical, I love musicals, you can fit in six songs, you can get the full story in there. And I mean, my, my reaction has always been the audience love them. Um, it's also a way too to cut out all of the, take the best parts of what you feel strongest about and uh, you know, put your best foot forward. I mean, if you're doing a musical and you have 15 or 20 songs, I mean, you have to admit as the creator of that musical that there's gonna be several songs in the first year that need a lot of work. Um, you know, take your best six, really polish those up, and then hopefully you can get someone to fund you. Thank so, you. so Dan, if, if I'm if I'm understanding what you're saying, um, I think you're looking at at festivals as just one aspect of of how you can develop your work and how you can get your work out. You as a writer, you know, you can send your script around to non for profit theater companies and regional theaters, and you can try to get an agent. Good luck with that. You can try to get an agent. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you don't, in this situation, this is a self-producing situation. This is where you are giving the given the opportunity to get your show up on its feet. And you're going to be the one that's taking a certain amount of responsibility for making that happen. That's not the way it is in all of theater. But it's a question of, of whether you want to sit around and wait until, until you are discovered by a producer who wants to take that task on. It, it doesn't have to be your task. It, it, this is your choice. Great, thank you. Um, Eric Jones. Hey everybody. Uh, first off, thank you for some thank you, thank you panelists for your um, your feedback. Um, question for me because uh, you know, I've actually participated in a couple, including uh, I'm familiar with Van uh, de Kirk. I did the, the Rianta Strawberry Festival uh, about uh, 13, 12 years ago. Um, oh. there was, yeah, I, I I learned a, a lot from that. Um, uh, what are your advice for people, especially if you, you know, if you get in the first time for like for for fundraising for for doing self-producing? What what kind of advice or tips you would do if you do get accepted into a festival like yours? Well, I, I'll 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 answer then. I'll ask everybody else if they want to answer as well. The the first thing I, I want to say is that um, people. First of all, you have to ask. For, you just have to ask for support. You have to have to ask for money. Uh, it's not going to just there's no magic closet that contains the money that you're going to use for your show. Um, I think I think that people need to get over the idea that there's something wrong with asking for money. And you have to understand that people are happy. If they like know you and they like you, they're happy to support you. So at a stage like this, like this, which is a very early stage of development where you're getting it up on its feet, maybe for the first time in a festival situation, um, Find the people who really want to support you 
and don't be afraid to ask them to support you. Tell them what you need. They're not going to be able to guess it if you don't tell them. They're not going to be able to guess that you need $2,500 from them unless you say, you know what, I'm, I have an opportunity to be in this festival. It's an opportunity for me to get the, my work up. I'm so excited about it. Can you help me make this happen? So you have to ask for the money. People tend to start with friends and family. It's, it's, it's the first place to go. Uh, when you're when you're putting your work up, but there's no shame in that. There's no embarrassment in that, and people can always say no, but you gotta ask, and you'll be surprised. Um, I ask, else can I that? throw in one? Yeah, yeah, I have I have one little quick thing on that. Um, you know, one of the things that I try and do, and I know the other festivals do as well, um, I try and have a very very elaborate light plot, so the sets and all those other things don't have to be any great cost. I mean, I'd say many of our shows are the bare minimum of like a few chairs and a, a plastic tree or what have you. And, you know, if you have friends who are actors who want to support you and Bob hit the nail on the head, you know, if you have that group and that community who wants to see your show succeed with you, um, and it's, you don't have to. Gene, Gene, it's not their show, it's you. They're investing in you. Well, Just remember that. Yeah, I'm just saying you don't have to spend, you know, don't go into it with these grandiose like fears, you know, start and think to yourself, okay, what's the least amount I could spend and have this show be great? What do I need? I need three chairs, a table and a beanbag, you know, I mean, like really don't over one of the things that I used to hear about Nymph all the time and Nymph was great. A lot of my friends were in it and what have you, but you'd have to spend 50,000 plus on a set and all these other things because that was, I the don't know. That it was the expectation. There yeah. was there, there became a, pr a pressure in Nymph to 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 shine to 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 have to you had to do what everybody else was doing. Uh, people were getting a lot of attention, and fifty thousand dollars. Try a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I was people trying were to spending. Be, people yeah. were spending ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, that's ultimately, I think, one of the things that, that led to it closing because it was just became unwieldy. It was just unwieldy. Yeah, normal people can't afford that. <laughs> you know, that's like a crazy, that's a number that's nuts. So don't don't let that by your obstacle. If you have a community of actors, I mean, one of the premises, and I think for all of our festivals, but for, for mine, I wanted to set up a platform where if you had a community of actors that would help you, um, I'll pay for everything else, you know, if it's a non-equity show. Um, you know, and that was one of the things that, you know, just to give writers, you didn't want cost to be an obstacle. So go into that with any of these festivals and, and think to yourself, gosh, you know, what do I really need to spend? And you'll see. So Eric, did we answer your question or did we answer everything but your question? Oh no, that was, that was it. That was very straightforward. That, yeah. Okay, that was it. Okay. Want to make sure. Uh, uh, Mika. Oh, uh, yes. Actually, I had a couple questions. Number one is if you do already have a cast of actors that are equity, but you kind of need them because they play bluegrass instruments, um, how open would, would your theater festivals be to that? And would that would that fall under anything that, um, like, as far as funding goes, would would the actors be funded as well? You know, my my bad. I didn't I didn't establish whether whether all of these festivals used used equity or non equity. I, um, I know that I know I think that 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 you can. I don't think you're prevented from using equity actors. Uh, Van, I get a letter. I I work out a deal with equity to where the actors, they know what they know what our project is and they've been very supported. So I get a letter saying you can use equity actors as long as you pay them. I think last time it was $110 a performance. Then you, 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 at one point you were non-equity. I, I know that you, you, you transitioned at some point. Yeah, well, for we, years, well, I- No, 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 I'm it's Van, not Dutch. Uh, yeah, we, we were using, um, we were doing equity and non-equity but we ran into a snag when a playwright, um, you know, and I was doing the paperwork for, for all the equity sh shows, but then we ran into a snag where a playwright had equity people and some of them were, you know, had worked on Broadway and they didn't let us know that they were working with equity actors. Mm -hmm. And then we did the show in the festival and their equity friends were coming to see it and wanting to get in using the equity card. And we didn't know that they were, you know, that their show was equity. So there was like a conflict at the box office. And then, you know, the person reported it to equity. It was a big mess. And after that, I just said, each person 
who's doing equity show has to take care of their own paperwork and pay their own actors because by us taking responsibility and then not knowing that it was an equity actor in the show, we end up getting taking the blame for it as if we were abusing the rules of equity. And that wasn't the case. So um, I, you know, I just changed that. I let anybody who's doing an equity show, let them take care of their own, you know, their own papers, submitting it, as well as taking care of paying any fees to their, their actors. Gloria, actually, uh, one thing that we never clar clarified with, with you, uh, do you do musicals? We haven't in a while, but we have done them, so we could do it again. And uh, historically, have you used equity and non-equity? Yes, both. Yeah. So uh, when you're self-producing in a festival, um, just to piggyback on what Van Dirk is saying, you, you do need to take responsibility for paying for for uh, for the obeying the rules of equity you can't expect the festival to necessarily know and by the way i want to also say something else that, that we talked about earlier which is the marketing um somebody said this but i want to say it again even though uh, when you go into a festival you have the advantage of their marketing the festival as a whole and you will ca be carried along on that do not under any any circumstances think that that's all the all the publicity you're going to need you need to do your own marketing that needs to be a budget item when you're going into a festival and it means you need it needs to be your budget item kate yeah i just wanted to remind people that is so important because even though we historically will bring a third of your audience in you are responsible for marketing your own show as well so i don't see any other questions people want to everybody let me on let me unpin um un unspotlight everyone and uh go on gallery view and People, come on in. Oh, Vinny, you have a question? Well, just the, now that you're mentioning the marketing, um, do you think an email blast is fine or postcards work better? Um, oh, that's such an interesting conversation. Do, do you have two hours? <laughs> uh, um, to, 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 quickly, let me just say that postcards became real, real tired for a long time. Then people stopped using them. Now, I think postcards are like the biggest surprise that somebody can get in the mail. It's like, oh my God, a postcard for a show. I, I personally think that, that, that postcards are, are ready to make a comeback. Um, most people, because the costs are a lot more minimal when you're doing e-blasts um, and you're not paying postage and all that, uh, people have tended to promote their work through, through the e-blasts. But that now, but now e-blasts have the postcard problem, which is everybody's inbox is so crowded with with e-blasts that it just all runs together in, in your in your mind. It just it's just like ah, not another the problem, one. The problem is most of the e-blasts are just text. You know, we're no, no, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about. I I get plenty of plenty of beautiful beautiful graphic uh, e-blasts. With with a, a nice graphic and and a, a text underneath it, and I mean, Glory, you did you did you did uh, graphics for every one of your shows. You did like fifty two of them or something. Yep. So you had somebody. To, so each each of the shows designs their own graphics, right? Um, it depends on the year. Some years we did it, and other years the shows themselves did it. Um, but usually we have. Uh, in the contract that we have approval over whatever the image is going to be um, just because, um, you know, we don't like to insinuate that we're supporting any type of illegal activity. Well, I'm, I'm, I can't help going into the marketing weeds. I was, I was raised in marketing. So uh, the, the other in, uh, crucial thing that for everybody to remember is social media. Um, you've got to have, first of all, you got to have a website. Um, Depending on your audience, you have to have visibility on Facebook or or Twitter or Instagram or things that I don't know. I, I, I don't even know how to do. I don't even know what TikTok looks like, except I watched I watched the uh, Ratatouille, the musical, which is phenomenal. Um, all of these things, the thing to remember about social media is it's not a sales medium. It's an awareness medium. Uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for, for, you, for you to, to get, get, get followers and, and get engagement and get interest. Um, and then, then you send them somewhere else to buy the tickets, uh, but not right away. The first 
thing that you say to, to somebody on social media is, is not, I'm having a show, buy a ticket. That's not the first thing you say. That's the last thing you say. Um, so uh, any, any other last minute questions? I think it's also important for playwrights to build a following of people who would want to see their play, their work. You know, you just can't depend on, you know, the festival to do everything for you. If you don't have any friends or any family that wants to see your work and nobody who wants to see it, then why are you doing it? You know, it, it, to me, it's like you should be bringing something to the table. It shouldn't just be all on the producer and doing it. I had one guy who wanted to do his show on a particular day. And I wouldn't have done it because it was a holiday where I figured a lot of people on that particular day wouldn't necessarily want to be seeing a show because they would probably be with family. But because, you know, he specifically wanted to do it, I did it. But then, you know, with the registration form, I can tell who's coming because of who. He had like three people who came to see his play. I'm like, three people? <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. And I'm like, you have plenty of time to promote it, to let your people know that you were doing this play, but yet you had nobody showing up. So why did you want to do it? You know, well, I think you know, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of magical thinking in, in the art world, in the artist's world. Um, there's a lot now of now you see it, now you don't. <laughs> No, build it, build, build it, and they will come. Um, no, you gotta, you gotta do the work. Everybody, you all have to do the work. It's not, it's not easy. Um, I so think I, people have to realize there's a business side to it, also. So I'm gonna, it's I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up for YouTube. So this is my way of saying thanks for the for anybody who's viewing us on YouTube, and I hope you'll you'll be uh, part of the true community going forward. Uh, okay, now we can chat. <laughs> Any anybody, uh, Glory? I I miss you, Glory. I, I I'm I'm so glad to to see you. It's been so long. Good to see you too, Bob. So Van Dirk, UIC, UIC. <laughs> we've been we've been in touch. We've been we've been working together on and off. Van Dirk did a great job uh, directing a play in our uh, our benefit in in February, uh, a woman's perspective. Um, I'm finding that, that some of the pieces from our benefit, because we were working on the theater authority uh, agreement and not ec an equity agreement, they're being given permission to actually submit, uh, be submitted to uh, festivals and things. So uh, I think it's pretty amazing. Um, so people are waving goodbye, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> no, that was a wave to say I, I have information about that. Oh, oh okay, even. <laughs> Yes, um, for um, for now, two plays from the the True Speak, um, they went back to um, SAG. I think SAG, SAG and after. I got and they got permission to use the films that was made for True Speak um, as part of the theatre. But I mean, they have to pay the actors again, so it's like a new contract basically. But there is life after after uh, you know the the benefit for for a lot of these pieces, which wouldn't wouldn't necessarily happen in in the lot in a live performance. So again, you know, there's there's all sorts of residual uh, residual uh, um, benefits from from being forced to be on Zoom. Um, in our in our benefit, uh, just so if you, if you didn't see it, uh, Van Dirk and and the other directors, uh, with Eben's help and and technologists' help, created films created actual films um that 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 work as as small 10 to 15 minute pieces of, of, of art um so uh it's it's just nice to think that something that seemed like it was the worst thing that could have happened in the world turned out to have so many benefits in so many ways um i'm very i'm very grateful for the last 15 months um, I'm very grateful for the things I learned in shutdown. Um, I'm very grateful for the things that were pushed to the surface in our country during shutdown. Um, I'm not happy with where we are now, but damn it, we all had to look at it and people are looking at it and we'll, well, I don't know where, all, where it's all leading, but COVID, COVID had a purpose, had a real purpose. 
uh, look at how the how how uh, emissions, the, the carbon emissions, were reduced over the past fifteen months. Uh, look at the way that, that that we were a little less messy with our planet in the last fifteen months. Will we take these lessons forward? Any any guesses? Everybody in this room, I think we will. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we will. You know, we also met a lot of nice people. We learned to set boundaries. We learned to love ourselves and to you know love other people, and to you know reassess things and realize what's really important in terms of friends, family, and community. I think there were a lot of benefits. And then also, you know, if you're working on a play and you want to try out a scene, knowing that you don't have to wait for all the actors to come together in one place, the benefit was you can easily go on Zoom, read that scene, see if it works. So there are a lot of people I know who are going to still be using Zoom as part of their process of developing new works. Yeah, I mean, it's the irony is that these are things that we could have done before the shutdown if, if we had just taken the leap of faith. So we were yeah. forced into a leap of faith. So, so congratulations to everybody who's here because we've all survived. Give us, give us all an, a, 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 a round of applause. Give yourself a round of applause. I'm proud of this community. So um, thank you for having me, Bob. I have to step out. Okay. But, um, I really appreciate uh, being included on the panel. Thank you. And thanks for all of your work uh, in the theater community in general. And I hope to see everybody another time. I hope that the people will become part of the Planet Connections community too. So you, 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 and, I, you and I both are big on community. Well, I think all everything everybody is. So is so is Van Dirk and so is Jean. We're com community is important to all of us. So um, I'll echo what Glory said before she jumps off, Bob. I think one of the reasons we're all here is really we respect what you're doing and we think you do a lot for the community. And I was in a meeting, a lunch meeting today, and I, we talked about you for a good five minutes, and it was all incredibly positive and all the wonderful things you're doing. So thanks a lot. You're welcome. I second that, Bob. You know, I, I, you bring together a lot of good panels that share so much valuable information every week, and you've been doing it consistently. And, you know, it's, it's a big benefit to everybody. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. 